Uh, hi, everyone. So it's a pleasure to be here in QCrypt. And as Dominic just said, I'll be presenting the two first um, experimental implementations of quantum money. So the first one is by the Paris group, uh, so us, these guys here. And then the second uh, experiment is by the Shanghai group. So the talk structure is going to be pretty simple. I'll just give a, an overview of uh, Wiesner's original protocol, Wiesner's original quantum money, and its drawbacks. And then I'll go through, I'll just divide the talk in two and go through the qubit pair protocol, which is the, the Paris protocol and how we implement it, and then the hidden, hidden matching state protocol, which is the Shanghai protocol and how they implement it. And then a conclusion, I'll try to give you like a comparison between the two protocols and the results to give you a better, uh, better idea. So quantum money, originally, um, this is what triggered the field of quantum information. It was uh, even before BB84. And the idea is to use the laws of quantum mechanics to make unforgeable quantum money. So the idea is you have a bank which generates a number of qubits n and generates a random secret classical key ks. And this is known by the bank only. Okay? And the money state, the quantum banknote state, is of this form here. right? So it's just a separable n qubit state with the this set of states that you all know. And, you know, in, in an ideal world, like, the, the quantum magnet would look something like that. So, you know, it would be a quantum memory where you store all the qubits, and you don't really care about the lifetime. The lifetime is more or less infinite, and you could just keep it in your pocket, and, and that'd, be some, that'd be quantum money. Um, so how, how does the original protocol unfold? Well, the idea is the bank generates this key and this quantum state and gives it to a client and the client keeps it with him. And every time he wants to make a payment, he's going to send the whole quantum state to the bank for verification. So the bank is going to verify with the classical key if all the measurements outcome measured in the correct basis coincide with you know, what the bank expects. And if everything coincides, then the bank will accept the banknote, OK, and the payment can proceed. Um, if there are some differences between the key and the outcomes, then the bank's going to reject the note, okay, declare the note as a forged note, as a counterfeit, and reject the payment, and the payment won't be able to proceed. So the unforgeability is guaranteed by the no-cloning theorem. Um, and there are some drawbacks to this original scheme. The first one, the major one, is uh, quantum verification. Um, so what I mean by this is sending the whole quantum state to the bank for verification. So this isn't very practical. Um, you know, if the bank is very far away, then obviously you get some transmission losses, some errors. So this is probably the biggest, you know, fault in this protocol. And it also opens uh, the doors to new attacks, this quantum <coughs> verification. And this is like adaptive attacks, uh, such as, you know, based on um, Elizabeth Weidmann's bomb tester, uh, you know, involving entanglement and stuff. So this quantum verification uh, opens the door to these attacks, so we have to fix it, and we can fix this with classical verification, okay, trying to have a protocol where we do the measurements locally and then send the, um, send the uh, communicate with the bank classically for verification. And then obviously in the original protocol, there's no um, security proof which take into account the experimental parameters, so we need this for an implementation. And then this is, this is the hard point. Um, it's private key in the sense that every time you want to verify a banknote, you need to communicate with a bank. And obviously, if it's money, right, if it's banknotes, you would ideally like it to be public key. Um, you know, so if I give you a banknote, you can verify it yourself. Um, and this, you know, it's been shown that you can't, you can't really have uh, information theoretic public key quantum money. So this point here, we're not going to address. But the, um, the three other points, here, both new schemes are going to uh, address these points, essentially. So we'll start with the qubit pair protocol, right, the protocol in Paris. So the idea here is instead of having uh, single qubit states in your credit card, so now I'm going to call it a credit card because it's, uh, it's private key, um, here we have a set of states of qubit pairs, okay, so, you know, in each pair you have, like, you have qubits encoded in conjugate basis, and you have a secret classical key, okay, which consists of three bits for each pair. Right? So you have the first bit, um, which indicates the basis in which the first qubit is encoded. And then the two other bits indicate the actual information contained in these qubits. And this is uh, 
quite elegant because it enables us to use a quantum retrieval game formalism to you know, derive our security bounds. And more specifically, one out of two quantum retrieval games. So the idea is to have um, two challenge questions which are gonna enable the bank to verify if the, bank, if the credit card is correct, is authentic, and then you're gonna have a security challenge which is a conjunction of both correctness challenges which is gonna materialize the probability of cheating, of forging the card, right? So what you want is you want the two correctness challenges to be as easy as possible to answer if you're honest, and then you want the security challenge to be as hard as possible to answer because obviously you don't want the card to be forged. Um, so if you consider only one pair and you consider an ideal case, you have C here, the probability of answering correctly one of these two questions. So for example, QXX is gets the two bits C0 and C1, such that the gets corresponding to the qubit prepared in the sigma X basis is correct. Well, here if you measure, for example, the first pair in the sigma X tensor sigma X basis, you'll always get the right answer to this question. So C equals one, ideally. And the same thing for QZZ, right? And then it's been shown um, in these papers here that this, uh, for the security challenge, um, the maximum achievable probability is three fourths. So for the epsilon here. So here's a little illustration of the protocol. So you have a bank, a client, and a vendor. So the bank has this three bit classical key, right? So three bits for each pair. Generates the quantum pair here, one plus, gives it to the client. The client keeps the credit card. And whenever the client wants to make a payment, he goes to the vendor, um, and the vendor is gonna be the one making the measurement, okay? So it's not gonna be the bank, it's gonna be the vendor. So the vendor takes a the quantum credit card, measures in the correct basis, so picks a random question, okay, either QXX or QZZ, randomly, and measures the whole block of pairs in the correct basis to answer this question. And then the vendor sends the outcomes classically, through, through a classical channel to the bank, and the bank checks if you know, if the, if the outcomes coincide with the key, sorry. Uh, so that's how the protocol unfolds, and it's got several advantages. So it's simple BB84 states, so when you go to an implementation, you're quite happy to have these states. Um, and, if, and when you go to quantum memories, you know, it's, it's gonna be even harder, so, so this is a good point. You have classical verification, okay, you, you don't have to send the quantum state to the bank anymore. This has been done in previous theoretical papers. Uh, it's a single round protocol. You have credit card reusability. Okay, by this I mean that if you select only a few states in the card uh, for verification, then you can reuse the other states that you haven't measured for future verifications. And then we implemented the telecom wavelength. Now here's the new challenge questions. If you go to n pairs and consider a tolerance uh, parameter delta here when you go to, towards experiment. So the idea is to define two new challenges for a credit card of n pairs this time. So you want to answer QXX for at least a fraction C minus delta of the n pairs. Okay, so this is the total fraction. And you, answer C minus, you want to answer C minus delta of, uh, QXX for C minus delta of these n pairs correctly. And then you do the same for QZZ here. And the idea is this delta that you, know, you, you lose here, you want to, uh, for the security proof, you give it to the adversary, right? You, give, you assume it all goes to the adversary, and so you have this overlap here, this conjunction of both challenges, which is epsilon plus delta. And then by just doing the maths, you can get an expression for delta as a function of C and epsilon. And then you get to the security conditions. So essentially, uh, with some turnoff bounds, you can you know, get a bound on the correctness C prime of this new game for n pairs, okay? And you can get a bound on the um, security epsilon prime of this new game. And you see that here it decays exponentially with the number of pairs n, and you have this delta parameter here. And then you can also derive this bound, which is gonna be what we want to check when we implement the, the protocol, all right? So if ex experimentally we get c larger than epsilon plus one over two, the average c that we measure for one pair, then we know that we're running the protocol successfully and securely. So this is the condition that we have to satisfy experimentally in order to check if our protocol is secure. And as you can see here, it's equal to seven eighths because we take obviously the maximum uh, probability of cheating, so three fourths. And also you can notice that it's a constant uh, bound here. And the idea is this works only if you use true single photons, okay? Because in that case you don't have attacks you know, which depend on losses and, or on, and on weak coherent states. So if you have true single photons, 
um, or a single emitted type quantum memory, that is a quantum memory that even if you input some weak coherent states, you'll get a single photon at the output because it's a single emitter, then in that case, that's going to be your bound. And it's not going to depend on mu because the single photons. Then, however, if you go to weak coherent states, which is what we use for the implementation, you have an average photon per pulse mu. And so here, you can consider this type of quantum memory, so atomic ensemble quantum memories, uh, which essentially preserve the Poisson distribution of your coherent state, but it just introduces um, attenuation. So here, you open doors to new attacks and uh, specifically unambiguous state discriminations attacks. Um, these attacks, um, essentially, you, you, can, you can derive, a if you know the set of states that you expect, right? you can derive um, you can a set of um, POVMs, which will, for, some, for a f certain fraction of the card, which will ena enable you to perfectly discriminate the states in the card. So it's going to boost your cheating probability. So here for the bound, you have epsilon plus 1 over 2 again, and you have this extra term PD here, which is the probability of discriminating the states. And this PD depends on mu, so you have f of mu here. And here, eta d is um, just a parameter which accounts for a finite number of statistics. Okay, We don't have an infinite number of pairs, so we can... Um, see what we get as results for different values of uh, eta here. And you get the new bounds with Chernoff here, so the correctness, and you have an extra term here in the, uh, in the security, which depends on PD and eta D, and the number of pairs, obviously. Um, so how do we implement the protocol? So here, I want to stress that we don't have a quantum memory. This is a proof of principle experiment, but the idea is to try to find the optimal range of parameters for the future implementation with a quantum memory and see if we satisfy you know, the, these, these two bounds here. So we generate blocks of Q qubit pairs on the fly, Okay, so materializing the credit card. We have the card reader, uh, which measures all pairs of each block, either in this basis or this basis, depending on which challenge question you randomly pick for verification. Um, and then the bank checks if the measurement data exceeds the security bound for both quantum uh, memory scenarios. Uh, and the bank, in that case, would be us. So experimentally, this is the setup. You have the credit card generation here. So continuous laser diode at te uh, telecom wavelengths. You chop it up with an Acuso optic modulator. You have an optical attenuator to um, go to lower mu's, right? Sing quasi single photon regime. Uh, here, this is the setup to monitor the power. And here, you have a polar polarization controller, which we use to generate our set of states. And they're encoded in polarization, right? So you. We apply a sequence of voltages, which generates our pairs of states here. And the mu, this is the important point, the mu that we want to measure is the output of the credit card. Because you know, when, you, when you're going to use a quantum memory, the bank actually encodes the quantum memory, encodes the quantum state. So there's no possible attack there, if you assume that you know, the bank is, uh, is honest. And, uh, and so the idea is the only attack that can happen is when you retrieve the states from the quantum memory, right? So the mu that we want them to, to measure is the output of the credit card. And then here we have a simple detection setup, uh, which is the vendor's card reader. So if you want to answer QXX, we'll put the half wave plate you know, at 22 degrees in order to measure in the sigma x, tensor sigma x basis. For QZZ, you'll put it at zero degrees. And you have um, uh, in gas single photon avalanche detectors here to detect which state you have. And these are the results. So here in the figure, um, the lines in red are the security thresholds. So just to remind you, there's two security thresholds, the constant one here for true single photons or weak coherent states used in single emitter type quantum memories. And then here you have the threshold dependent on mu, which um, encompasses these uh, USD attacks. So here, this is the constant 7 8 threshold, and this is the mu dependent uh, security bound. Here is mu, that's the average C that you measure, right, with the experiment. And here in blue are some simulation curves for different values of P. So P would be the, the purity of the state. Um, and with our experimental parameters, right? So, for example, for detection efficiency, we have 25%. Uh, we consider that we post select uh, when more than one of the de detector clicks. Uh, so all these are in these simulations here. And we see that our data points here uh, correspond to a purity of 93%, sim a simulation for 93% purity. And we also see that they're all above the security threshold for quite a, quite a wide range of mu's, actually. So 
So from point, you know, point 0.02 to 1. Here you, you violate these security bounds. So, you have a, so we run the protocol successfully for these values of mu. Um, and we have a noise tolerance which lies around 24%. Uh, because here, as you can see, for the 76% purity, you have an intersection with these bounds. And there's no value of mu for which uh, you can get a secure protocol. So that would be our noise tolerance here. Yes. And obviously, when you run the protocol, you want to reach a certain uh, a given security, right? So here are just uh, the plots of these expression of the C primes and the epsilon primes here, of the bounds that we get. So here, for a given, you know, a given epsilon prime, a given security, uh, these graphs show the trade-off between the number of pairs <laughs> n that we have in our cards and the, the, the average photon number per pulse mu. So here for different values of mu and eta, uh, you can find, you know, you can know which number of pairs you need for your, for your security to reach this level. Okay. So that was the first protocol and the first implementation. And now I'm going to talk on behalf of the Shanghai team. So uh, I apologize if sometimes I'm, I say we, because uh, I might say that, but it's, it's the Shanghai team. <laughs> OK. So here the idea is the same, right? It's to have a first implementation of quantum money. Uh, but it's not going to be encoded on the same types of states. It's not going to be qubit pairs anymore. Um, but you'll see that in the end, we have fairly similar results, actually. So here we're going to encode the information in hidden matching states. And um, so hidden matching states of states of this form, right, for dimension n. And the questions that the bank is going to ask, right, for verification uh, are going to be related to the phases. Um, so here, the parity of the phases. So xi plus xj was the parity. And same thing, if you compare to the secret classical key and the bank is satisfied with the, with the, um, with the outcomes, then the, the coin here, it's called the coin, the coin is going to be verified. Otherwise, it will be rejected. Um, and this is based on some results from graph theory. Uh, here is the simple example for the states we're going to use. We're going to use hidden matching states of dimension 4. So if you have n equal 4, you have n minus 1 possible uh, pairwise disjoint sets of matchings. And this is a general result. So here, if you have um, this n equals 4 materialized by these four vertices here, you can have three different matchings, right? The first one is going to be 1, 3, 2, 4. The second one's going to be 1, 4, 2, 3. And the third one's going to be 1, 2, 3, 4. OK? So there's no pairs in commons between these sets. So how does the protocol actually unfold? Well, here you have a classical binary register R, OK, which is set to 0 um, at the, you know, when, the, when, the, when the coin is generated. And you have this state where each of the xi's here are a hidden matching state of dimension n. And the idea is, this time, the main difference between both protocols is that in our protocol, you have the card reader, which uh, randomly picks a question and measures. And the card reader is honest, right? The vendor is honest. Here is going to be the holder who verifies the states himself, OK? So the idea is the holder has the coin and randomly picks one of the three matchings, if you have you know, dimension four. Um, here he picks m2 and picks the pair one, three. Uh, sorry, the pair 1, 3 for matching M2, and then sends the parity that he measures to the bank. Same thing on this state here. And then he updates the binary register to 1 for the states that he has measured. So just like before, you have some conditions for the experimental implementation to work and to be secure. And um, here it's going to be, uh, you're going to have to pay attention to losses um, you know, to see if you have some loss dependence attack loss dependent attacks going on, sorry. So the idea is you abort the protocol if the number of randomly chosen verification states L that you expect when you measure is lower than eta L, okay, where eta is your uh, overall detection efficiency. And then you have this small gamma here which you can optimize, okay, this small security parameter. So if you have your L, your overall number of states which is lower than this threshold here, then you know that there may be some attack going on, and you abort the protocol. So that's one condition. And then you've got to have the condition of uh, when do you accept the state? When do, you, when do you actually accept the coin? Well, here it's going to be uh, the same idea as uh, before. You, have, you need epsilon, which is the error rate, the measured error rate, right, to be lower than a certain bound. 
And here it's beta plus delta. So beta is the error rate that you expect if you have an honest, you know, if everyone's honest. So you can measure this before you do the experiment. And, and delta here is the gap, or like half the gap between uh, beta and the minimum uh, error rate achievable by the adversary. OK, so this is what you want to check experimentally in order for the protocol to be valid. And then you can derive bounds with Chernoff as well of this sort. So here I've written epsilon prime so you don't get confused. It matches with the previous protocol. So that's the probability of forging, which you know goes down exponentially. And um, here is 1 minus C prime, so the probability of honest fail. These are the, the bounds that we get. So how do you run the protocol? Um, the idea he, here is to use four-dimensional hidden matching states and to actually map them on coherent states, on trains of coherent states. Um, so if you have a, a hidden matching state of dimension four like this, it's been shown here in this paper that you can map the information onto uh, a train of four coherent states and you encode the information in, in the phase here as well. And this, the question is going to be the same, right? You're going to need the phase parity uh, between pairs of coherent states within these trains of these, you know, blocks of four coherent states. So here's the setup. Um, so you have a laser intensity and phase modulator, an attenuator here to go to low mu's, and then you have a one by three uh, beam splitter here. Now this part here is going to materialize the random choice of the holder, right? So this is the choice of matching, essentially. So here the choice is going to made, be made randomly by the states, right? So, and, it's, and this setup here is going to um, make us interfere all possible pairs for, from the three matchings. So here you see you have Max Zender interferometers on the three arms, and they have varying arm lengths here, okay, in order to interfere with the different, uh, the different pulses you get in, this, the, uh, in these blocks of four pulses, okay? And each of these coherent states here are separated by two nanoseconds. So here you have an arm of, uh, you have the arm here, this one is introduced as a delay of two nanoseconds, and here you have four, four nanoseconds. And here these delays here are just when you process the data later on, they enable you to know actually which pairs you've interfered, which arm you've been through. And then you recombine this with a three by one detectors, and you detect here. So these are the results and how the, the protocol actually unfolds experimentally. So you have a calibration phase first, and then you have a verification phase where you actually run the protocol. So the calibration phase, the idea is um, you, you, you count the number of pairs that you have for, the number of counts, sorry, that you have for each matching pair. And since for the security to work, you need uh, all, the, uh, all the pairs to be equally likely to occur, then you will calculate how much, what percentage of, the, of each, uh, for each pair you need to keep in order for all pairs to be equally likely. So that's the point of the calibration phase. And then you can actually calculate the, measure the overall detection efficiency, okay? And the expected error rate by an honest participant. So that's what the bank or the you know, experimenter does before running the protocol is this calibration here to get these two parameters and to know how to post select the number of pairs. And then you have the second part, which is the verification. So here you see that you keep outcomes so that the pairs are roughly equally likely, and you measure the error rate. So you calculate all these parameters uh, theoretically, so the gamma, which can be optimized, the minimum uh, error rate achievable by the adversary, um, which can be derived theoretically, the gap delta, because you know the beta here, uh, the th threshold number of states for the protocol to abort or not, and the maximum allowed error rate, beta plus delta, which here is 4.77%. So you do an average of all these error rates, and you, so, so you find an average error rate of 3%, which is lower than this threshold, so, you have, so your coin is valid, essentially. So here, they've run the protocol successfully, um, and you can see this with this bound here. Okay, so as a conclusion, just to the take-home message, uh, some parameters from both protocols and some advantages. Uh, so qubit pair protocol encodes with qubit. Uh, hidden matching state protocol encodes in uh, hidden matching states phase parity. Uh, experimentally, we both use uh, weak coherent states. Uh, in our case, we encode in polarization of weak coherent states. Um, in their case, they encode in uh, phase parity of pairs of these weak coherent states. 
noise tolerance here, 24% um, as I showed for our, our protocol. Here you have 16.6% .6 for n equals 4, but you've got to bear in mind that if you go to higher dimensional matchings, uh, hidden matching states, you can actually increase uh, this bound. Okay, so uh, here they've impl implemented it with n equals 4, but you can get a higher noise tolerance here. Uh, number of photons per pulse is this range for our protocol. So I've picked the higher range so that we have a more efficient protocol when we, uh, you know, less post election. Uh, and here is the hidden matching uh, for hidden matching state protocol, 0.25. Here, just to give you an idea of the number of, uh, of successful measurements you need for a given security <coughs> level, so I've picked 10 to the minus 7. These are the values here, so slightly lower for the hidden matching state protocol. Measured error rates are pretty much the same. And then this is what you require. So here it, it's uh, one, uh, you know, one by two uh, PBS, polarization controller, detectors, and here you add a three by one beam splitter, and you have some uh, Max Zender interfer interferometers. And advantages, well, this protocol is fairly simple because we use these BB84 states. Um, and the hidden matching protocol, uh, you, you have this, the fact that if you use more coherent states in your block, right, you increase the dimension of the hidden matching states, and so you can get a higher error tolerance. Now the idea um, for the next step that we're actually starting right now is, in the Paris group, right, is to run the protocol with an atomic ensemble type quantum memory, okay? And we want to see if we still get these, uh, these, you know, if we still violate these security bounds, and also if we satisfy uh, some other conditions which, you know, enable us to run the protocol securely with a, with a quantum memory. So thanks for listening.